Hello everyone, hey, how you doing? Welcome again to Running Tales with me, Craig Lewis, where we tell the extraordinary stories of everyday runners. Now, as you know, we are part of the Everyday Podcast, the, sorry, the Everyday Athlete Podcast Network. Bit of a tongue twister, that one for me today. Um, and you may well be watching this in a number of different places because if you're watching now at six o'clock in the UK, and I apologize, I have no idea where you're, what time it will be where you're watching all around the world. But if you're in the UK, you might be watching us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Instagram because we are across all of those networks and, uh, and we welcome, um, we welcome you wherever you are. Uh, you may also be listening to us as part of the podcast network that goes live on on Thursdays after the Tuesdays when we uh, when we have this live chat. Um, so yeah, listen to us on Spotify and all sorts of things there because the Everyday Athlete Podcast Network is full of lots of fantastic shows uh, from Food Fight Friday with uh, Jason Bahamundi and uh, and Adam Lee from the Community trail running podcast which is also brilliant but i have to say listen listen to adam's podcast but listen to our podcast first uh, because that's the most important thing um beyond the finish line with joe harden the fireside chat what's on your earbuds where you can listen to loads of really cool music recommendations that you can then uh, have a listen to when you're out running uh, and caffeinated coaching it's uh, a wide array of things including our own running tales and on the subject of running tales please do check us out on our substack as well runningtales.substack.com where you can buy merchandise like the t-shirt i'm wearing today and you can uh, read written stories versions of these podcasts and other stories as well so that's runningtales.substack.com but anyway that's enough of that let's uh, let's bring on today's um today's guest it's tarn westcott and tarn has got a fantastic story uh, all about how he's kind of on a collision course with uh, the ultra trail de mont blanc and he's just done so so many uh, ultras and i'm really looking forward to having a chat with tarn today so uh yeah let's bring uh let's bring tarn forward and have a chat with tarn how, how are you doing oh i'm fine thanks thanks for having me oh uh, yes uh, you to be here you're so welcome um tarn now i want to start off this conversation by talking about the most recent race you've done because uh you've just um you've just got back from europe um from taking part in i think it was a hundred mile race through the um through the swiss alps how did it all go well it, it actually went really quite well um i was quite anxious about it because it, it wasn't my first attempt it's actually my sixth attempt at 100 miles in the mountains which I know might sound ridiculous to to some, and I know you certainly get people who are well equipped or or perhaps lucky enough to complete on their first attempt. But no, I've I've definitely had my fair share of um, mistakes and bad experiences, and so I was very very certain that this was going to be the one for me. Um, and and actually, I've said that each time I've gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, uh, but I did prepare very, very well. Um, most of the effort actually went in mentally preparing and uh, the physical stuff I kind of had reasonably well in hand. But no, it was a very good experience. Um, very, very enjoyable, um, believe it or not. When, when you're taking on a, a race like that, I mean, it's I've, I've never done 100 miles. I've done a I've done 100K, but never 100 miles and certainly not through through the mountains. Look, it's hard enough anyway without perhaps some of that um you know that mental baggage from from having dns behind you already H how do you get through the hard times that we all get on those really long runs when you've got in the back of your mind i've fallen down at this point before uh it's a, it's a really good question there's no simple answer to that although i had a lot of support um not physically in 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 presence in in resort um, or on the course, but uh, I know my family were all rooting for me. I've got a great circle of friends; they were all cheering me on. You know, I got I got my fair share of of messages going into the event, and you know, everybody knew what this this meant for me. Um, I, I kind of hinted I, I I've had a couple of um, you know a couple of failures under my belt and. Most of the time, I know why they have been. You know, when you push yourself to a certain place, everybody's different, okay? And your breaking point is different. And some people can't handle the physical aspect. I've, I've, I think I've, it's fair to say for me, I've never really had too much of a challenge in that respect. I am by no means an extraordinary runner. Um, but 
I've always put the work in around the training and, and um, I've been quite resilient in that respect. But it's when you get to a certain point, your mind starts playing games with you and, and, and sometimes wants to tell you to stop well, well before your body is ready to. So that is where I put the focus in. And I just, I just kept very positive throughout the whole race. And, and it might sound very simplistic, but that's genuinely what I did. I, I removed all of the stress items. Um, like many ultra runners, I guess, in this country, um, and, and I assume around the world, I am not fortunate enough to earn a living from it. I, in fact, I earn nothing from it. I do it <laughs> purely for my own enjoyment. And and I guess how, why I'm here, or why I'm where I am now is is another story, but I do this for fun, my own ambition, my own aspirations and targets. And so I keep having to remind myself, look, I signed up for this. I chose to be here. Um, and the difficulty is you have to juggle that with a lot of other things. Work is very demanding. Yeah. Um, most of us juggle family. We're lucky to be juggling family as well. And, and it's a constant... It's a constant battle, you know, where do you where do you spread your time? But I was I was very lucky. I was able to just switch everything off, be selfish for a few days and um, and dedicate my headspace to it. And and it, and it worked out very well for me. Yeah. I mean, given given all of that, how amazing was it to to, to cross that finish line and kind of think, yeah, that's it. I've, I've done it. I've done 100 miles in the mountains. Uh, it- I did have an enormous sense of relief, but again, it's it's me putting the pressure on me. Nobody else, nobody else cares less, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, I said my my friends and family are very supportive, but I, I don't think they really truly understand um, the pressures that I put on myself. And of course, I'm there really desperate to prove to myself I can do it. And so, you know, when I say sixth time. That's three previous UTMB Chamonix attempts, um, and and my my DNFs have all been explainable. You know, I'm not proud necessarily, but I, I do have justifications for them. And um, two other attempts in, in other places. So I really, really was very determined to to tick this box. And I, ironically, it didn't give me the emotional satisfaction. I think you're you're hinting at yes it was hugely relieving and um and and very rewarding but for me the ultimate is uh, uh, i mean i start to get emotional now just thinking about it i just need to cross that finish line in chamonix uh yeah for anyone who has never never been there it's just impossible to articulate the atmosphere and environment it really is so moving and everything about it. So I, I didn't get that from from Switzerland. Um, it's just a shame because it was definitely worth worth it, considering the investment of uh, you know physical investment, emotional investment in in the whole race. But um, now my sights are set on a fourth return to Chamonix if I can fit it in around everything else. Yes. Yeah, I, I definitely want to talk to you probably at some length about UTMB in a bit, but um, should, perhaps let's uh, just rewind a little bit and find out how you, uh, maybe how you got into running and doing this sort of crazy running in the first place. I mean, I know because I've uh, I've spoken to you before after you did a, uh, a race mm-hmm. in Nepal that we might touch on as well. I sort of know partly how you did it, um, which was almost through a pub bet, but uh, I don't know whether that's the starting point or we need to go a little bit further backwards. Uh, well, I, I always used to, I guess as a child, I used to run quite a lot and I was never particularly good at football or, you know, the other things you aspire to do as a kid. And I always ended up coming back to running and uh, then I I stopped, you know, as I entered my teens and, and, and got back into it a little bit early, early adulthood. And I ended up running London Marathon. I was very lucky to get a place. Um, I've almost applied every year since and haven't been haven't been lucky. It's so difficult to get a place at London now. Yeah. Uh, and I, I did I did London Marathon and had an absolutely awful time. <laughs> Didn't enjoy it at all. And when I crossed the line, I vowed I'd never run again. And that was back in 2004. 
and then some years passed and uh, an old friend of mine a very good friend of mine uh Darmish, who you know um uh, got in touch with me and we met up in a pub and asked quite out of the blue if i ultimately if i fancied running with him to brighton uh, you know as if there was nothing better to do <laughs> and i i took him up on his i took him up on his offer and 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 so we put the work in put the training in and i would say you know six eight months later whatever it was we did we ended up running from london to brighton and we had a great day and and that's where it all kind of re-kicked back off i did some triathlon um you know quite i want to say quite a few years ago 20 years ago and and um sporadically ever since but i just never really enjoyed the swimming i, I used to put the work in but i just naturally am not very good in the water and so I wanted to spend my time, my, my precious free time, doing stuff that I enjoyed. Um, yeah. And I just didn't enjoy time in the water. Plus, I had a, a couple of shocking experiences taking part in a, a cross-channel relay, which I won't go into now. But uh, it was it was one of the most horrific experiences of my life. <laughs> and so I, I, I think that was probably the last time I took part in a in a triathlon. So I always came back to running, and um, yeah. um, it's it's kind of what I I can do. I feel I'm re relatively good at it. It's kind of natural for me. I don't. I, I'm I'm a little bit lazy, if I'm honest, and I don't have to try too hard to run okay. And and so that's what I enjoy. I don't enjoy going out with the stopwatch and timing myself. I just enjoy going out. And thinking about nothing, and and just enjoying being outside and uh, and running. So uh, that's what I started doing more of. And and then again, it's easy to fit in around work. You know, you start to you, you just start to run a little further each time, and you pick a few events, and then the events get longer, and suddenly you're entered into some big races, and um, it becomes a bit addictive. You know, you. Yeah you kind of get hooked oh what, what can i do next i've done i've done 50 miles maybe 100k and then suddenly you've got 100 miles and you know the banter with your friends can't really call yourself an ultra runner until you've done 100 miles and then it just <laughs> it, it just never stops so uh i think the dnfs are telling because that's when you start to juggle a bit too much and and the running maybe it stops becoming your priority and your focus and you use it as a reset and a relax and to clear your head and um and as i said earlier you have to fit it around things so look, i don't think they hurt some cases the the dnfs in, in my um running cv have have all been justified. I, ne I never feel like, oh, that was so unfair. You know, it's just the way it is. It's just just out for a run. OK, so um, you just have to juggle things and, and work out what's what's important for you at the time. But running's always been a nice source of, of, of kind of um, self-care time, headspace time. Yeah, I, I think the DNFs are, are, are really interesting, actually, because, I mean, when you get into the the ultra world it's you you could be taking on a hundred mile race and you could do 95 miles in dnf you, you could do 15 miles in dnf but you're gonna mm -hmm. have you could be out there for hours and even days before you do what is you know what some i think maybe people who don't understand it so much might might call a failure but you can still have, i guess a have an incredible experience and b do something utterly incredible in doing just 70 miles of a hundred mile race Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A, a couple of my friends who I almost certain know will be listening to this, if not live or, or on the replay. They know yeah. who they are. Um, <laughs> they cannot comprehend the um, the concept of a, of a DNF. But Dharm and I, we, we've done a lot of runs together and we often used a lot of the big races to prep and do training, you know, re rehearsals in readiness for the big races. Now, look, OK, I didn't finish some of those big races. But we certainly weren't going to jeopardize a potential success just because we wanted to finish in a in a in a hundred miler. And um, I, I actually think that's quite a healthy outlook, right? I, I haven't ever felt the need just to finish a race for the sake of it, but yeah. use the experience to practice something and or or to rehearse, go through the motions. Am I ready for this? Am I ready for that? And so 
yeah, I've got a few few DNFs, but, but they don't bother me at all, right? I'm, and I have to put things into perspective. Like I do this for fun. I'm I'm not earning money from it. I don't have yeah. sponsors or anything, right? This is this is just about being ready to take on and and achieve the goals I want to achieve, right? Yeah, and we should be, you know, should be fair when we're having this conversation and say that yeah, you've got those odd DNFs against your name, but you've got plenty of uh, finishes as well, and plenty of finishes at. at very long races and very tough races. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether what sort of order you'd rank them in, but I, I know they include things like five days across Nepal and also the the Marathon de Saab. I mean, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, they were both wonderful events. Um, Marathon de Saab was 10 over, no, it was 10 years ago. Um, that was when it was difficult. Oh, I'm going to, oh, it's got a controversy. I'm only joking. Anyone who's done it, I'm just joking. Calm down. Um, yeah, the, I mean, truly rationed water and, um, you know, no phones allowed. It was an amazing experience. Nepal, that was back in November with Go Beyond and Simon Hollis's team. It was an amazing event. It was just wonderful. Very different vibe. Very, very relaxed um hugely enjoyable and and so much more intimate right and a, a much much smaller group um the care and the attention from from the support teams and the crews out there was phenomenal it was it was a really amazing event and um no i didn't dnf that one no well we should tell people <laughs> we should tell people tom because uh you not only didn't dnf it you you won that race Oh, I did. <laughs> it's quite, quite a surprise. Um, we, we, we were just going out for, in fact, I was talking to a very good friend of mine last night, Russell, who was also on the pool. And we were only talking last night about what an amazing trip it was. It it was, more, I don't know if Simon will appreciate me saying this, but it was almost much more like a holiday than it was uh, a five day ultra because it was just so friendly. And um, it was just like hanging out with your mates for for five days seven days and running through the foothills of the himalayas i mean what's what's not to love about that it was it was a tremendous event and the scenery was just was just breathtaking uh, i mean it was i think it just everything worked well for me i found myself uh, moving quite well and um on day one chasing down the the leading lady in fact the leader the the leader of the race helen and um you know, everything kind of started to fall into place after that, and and I ended up doing quite well. So I was I was very pleased. Yeah, a very unexpected uh, victory, and almost certainly my only win ever. <laughs> oh, but it's great to be able to say that. And I mean, we don't, you know, we don't do these things to win races and a lot of races. No, you know, never going to be anywhere near the front at all. But um, no, no, no. You know, fantastic to sort of have that on your CV and have that experience as well. It is. It is. A, it was a wonderful trip. So anyone thinking of doing doing uh, something a little bit different, have a have a look at Go Beyond's Nepal trip, um, November, end of November time, I believe it is. Very, very worthwhile. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and and as we sort of touched on, you've done a lot of these um different events, and and we've talked about you going to um. Uh, to Nepal, uh, to the Swiss Alps, to to Chamonix, um, mm -hmm. to um, the Sahara with with MDS. Is is the travelling and getting to see different parts of the world part of it? Because because you could just continually race from London to Brighton or whatever. Well, that's that is true. Look, it's it. I am. I never. I never forget the fact. I'm. I'm very lucky. Okay. Um, I'm in a fortunate position where. I can escape every now and then and, and do some of these races. But look, if I'm completely honest, the races abroad, they do offer a, a certain amount of extra stress because you've got to pack all your stuff. And, you know, it's not like you can load it into your car and uh, you're not driving to Dorset or Surrey. Um, definitely packing for Swiss Alps two, two weeks ago was, was particularly uh, stressful for me. But you, wherever you're running, you see parts of the world that probably 96% of the country just don't see. I mean, yeah. uh, and both of my sons have done done some running with me in the last couple of years. And uh, one of them, my oldest, he ended up 
crewing for me or at least shadowing me on one of the uh, North Downs Centurion run. And he was just gobsmacked by the by the beauty of of the trail. You know, you just drive up, you, you follow a path and suddenly you're looking out over the downs in the middle of nowhere. And we we often say when we're out running, it's just some of the most beautiful calming places and the views are stunning and you can't hear anybody can't hear traffic i mean that's what i love um it doesn't really matter where it is i just love trail running just because of the the, the quiet and the silence and and the scenery just the 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 countryside it, it's it's just really nice right so um that's definitely one of the drivers for me but of course when we go abroad and you're in the mountains you you spend most of your time with your jaw on the floor when um, when I when I went out to Switzerland last week, I used the Wednesday to get get all the camera, the photo taking out of the way, get it out of my system, right? I get up to the top, have a look around, try and acclimatize, and take all the photos that I want because your camera's got to go away. When you when you're actually running those races, there is an element of a huge amount of extra care you have to take with you. You know where you're putting your foot and looking out on the trail it's also much more demanding so you can't be you can't be running and um taking photos else you, you do risk falling down right so wherever you are though just appreciating your surroundings and looking around you're just taking time to absorb and 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 specifically that was one of the things i said i was going to do out in switzerland was keep my head up make sure i'm looking around and soaking it all up do not run the whole race looking down on the floor. Yeah. Um, you know, blood, blood coming out of your eyes. <laughs> there's there's no point, right? I mean, what yeah. am I proving? And and I'm jeopardizing a finish. It'd be much better off to do what you can, be realistic, manage your resources, keep the food going in, and enjoy the experience. Right. That's that's what it's that's what it's about for me. Yeah, no, I think that's um that's so true. I was um I, I was writing a, a a piece earlier about um uh, a race I did in in Derbyshire. It's uh, the Dovedale Dash. It's called. It's it's absolutely crazy. It's through mud. You actually run through a river. It's only four and three quarter miles long, but I think it's harder than the hundred k I did. It's an insane race, but it is in an absolutely beautiful part of the world. And I'm really happy that when I when I did that, although I kind of went as fast as I can, which isn't very fast, I, I also looked around and enjoyed that race because I think if you don't do that, unless you're Again, unless you're that person who's who's a, a, an international or, or paid for athlete, what's the point? Enjoy what you're seeing because sure. it's so spectacular. Absolutely, for sure. You know, being present in the moment and really enjoying those experiences are what it's all about. And and I actually, on that note, quite often it's the training and the preparation and that those those journeys in their entirety that yeah. build up build up the memories that that you kind of look back on um, the race only ends up being that much of, uh, of of your experience. Obviously, Switzerland was was truly tremendous. It really was amazing and demanding like I've I've never experienced anything like it, um, but still a very rewarding and memorable uh, experience. Yeah. And, and you mentioned with some of the trips abroad and so on and, and with with, with Switzerland as well, sort of some of the kit you have to take for for people who've maybe not taken on those kind of races. What do you what do you have to take with you? I mean, are you you taking poles with you and then a massive backpack? What what sort of things are you taking? Uh, well, it's, I mean, these in itself are, are almost entire topics and conversations. Um, it's 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 good. It's a good question, actually. So, I went through a couple of iterations of what I might use or might not take and then you kind of you question yourself have i made the right call here what's the weather going to be like there's so many factors that go into deciding um i ended up going with uh my trusty salomon 12 liter vest um i was quite ruthless this time i've got a history of packing too much stuff just in case i get cold you know putting that puffer jacket in putting that yeah. extra top in I mean, look, it's not unreasonable uh, when you're quite remote and pushing yourself to the point that you might have to stop or certainly over terrain that you could trip on. 
you've got to allow for the fact that you might be sitting in the cold for a little while and that is not a good scenario at, at two and a half thousand meters or you know on the dorset coast or or anywhere at night in the rain so um i've always been one to err on the side of caution and 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 pack for the the what if I, i'm certainly not going to go out with bare minimum but what i did do in switzerland was i was quite ruthless the bag drop arrangement was particularly good so I just made sure I had spare kit. Uh, I mean, literally spare change of clothes for any eventuality in each bag. Um, I had food. I had emergency supplies. Um, in one bag, I had a, a, like a mini first aid kit. I did take spare poles. I ended up snapping one of my expensive licky poles um, quite uh, um, unexpectedly. Apologies. I think my. I hope that hasn't disrupted the call my phone is okay. ringing. uh all, all, all good all good good um oh it does look after me saying all good that uh, we've temporarily lost uh tarn but uh hopefully he'll be he'll be coming back soon um paul back in firmly back in place to help him across the uh uh, across the Swiss Alps as as, um, as as quickly as possible there. Um, so yeah, let's uh, um, let's hope Tarn gets back quickly. I'm, I'm I'm really fascinated just talking about my own experience of carrying a load of kit. It's not something I've I've done on a load of trips, but I did do it on um, the Isle of Wight Challenge, which was a 100k race I've done. And you have to choose. I think so so carefully what parts of what bits of kit that you take and um uh and, and, and don't take because you, you, you it can be too hot it can be too cold and um, and you never know what happened Tan, you're you're back i did lose you for a second in the end there but uh that's no no problem we'd um we just got to the point where you've um, unfortunately snapped one of those valuable poles but you're, yep. you're sorry you're <laughs> sorry about that you can hear me okay yeah, I can hear you well. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, snapped, I, I ended up stumbling. I think it was at night. Um, snapped one of these poles, so I just had to shove it in my quiver. And I, amazingly, I packed a spare set of poles, which you might think was quite frivolous to have spare poles. You know, you just accumulate kit over time, and you just don't want to take, just don't want to take chances. And so, um, I, I didn't end up using them, but I had spare torches. Um, I even packed spare trainers. Now, I'm not one to change my trainers mid-run. Um, I took a bit of a gamble with my shoe choice this time. But again, going into the event, I knew the weather was going to be good for, if not the whole event, at least 90, 95% of it. So, yeah, kit, kit choice and packing your kit for an event is is very important on an event like that and of course when you i have been running for a long time you accumulate stuff and you work out you work out what's the stuff you keep to hand and and all of that went with me yeah yeah i love um conversations about kit because it it, it always makes you realize how much uh, uh of a lie the old comment that you all you need to do is get a pair of traders to go running <laughs> no it's it's not and and in fact um Back to the topic uh, previously we covered, one of the things I did was try to make sure I, I didn't have anything to stress about at all. So I totally disconnected from work. Um, my, my, I, I love my job, but it's very demanding. And I just had to make sure I was severed from it. Um, I had to make sure nothing on me was going to cause me aggravation. So, you know, charging batteries, I just got rid of anything that was going to need charging. Um, I just needed it to be simple, uh, simple exercise and there'd be no faff. So I could genuinely just enjoy the process and um, I didn't have to remember anything. It really turn up. Oh, your kit bags here. Great. Take, take the food that's in it and off you go uh but yes packing going back to our original point packing for um a, an ultra or a big event abroad always poses extra stress yeah yeah definitely i mean if you you know you, you spoke uh, a little bit earlier about your your friends thinking you're mad to do the long distances we've spoken about um you know the the ah oh, the positives and the negatives of packing all that kit and and and, and so on um 
do, 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 uh, you know about the DNFs um, that can happen along the way when you're taking on these really hard challenges? Do you ever not sort of think I'm going to do a half marathon? <laughs> Is that not your, you're just not into that kind of running? Um, well, no, again, uh, I'm, I mean, I hinted earlier, there's an element of me that's quite lazy. I, I don't <laughs> like, I don't like the timing and the whole, if I end up doing a half marathon, I know what I'm like, and I'm going to end up wanting to do a, a quick half marathon. And then yeah. where does that stop? Now, having said that, on my run up to Switzerland, I did um, I did quite a, a varied set of training. I really mixed it up. I ended up doing bike time, um, sprint time on the treadmill. I did incline walking with and without weights, uh, walking to and from part of my commute for work. And I ended up doing long runs home from work as well. So I did a bit of everything. And I have to say, I did enjoy getting back into the whole sprint uh, cycle and, and gradually building up. Um, both of my sons are, are, are quite quick. And I and that's kind of inspired me maybe to, yeah. to redirect my efforts now that I've got Switzerland out of the way, you know, on the rundown in, in towards Christmas as it gets darker and, and start doing some faster times on the treadmill. But no, really, no. To answer your question, I love the long distance stuff. I love being out on the trail. I, I don't really have any interest in banging out uh, 13 or 26 miles on the tarmac. It's just not my thing. And, you know, even even the shorter runs, uh, for, for a couple of friends, uh, Russell again, he said, well, you know, why don't you look at doing some of the shorter events in Chamonix? But for me, that's just, just not what I want to do. You know, I know I've got it in me to do to do the full distance um, physically and mentally now. So that is my goal that's that's what i want to do and and no so the shorter distance stuff doesn't really doesn't really grab me yeah well that, that brings us quite nicely actually doesn't it onto chamonix and, and utmb um i mean it's a huge uh thing to take on utmb because it's not just the event itself and it's not even just the training because you have to do all the other um qualifying events and everything else yeah. to get to get ready for it um did you, at what point did you sort of think this is what I really want to do and 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 I'm going to go all out for UTMB? Well, I think it's fair to say when we first entered, I think our first entry was 2016. We had really no idea what you're headed into in terms of extreme, and and by that point we we'd done some hard events, we'd done some you know quite a few hundred milers. Yeah. And most of them had gone very well, actually. Uh, but nothing can really prepare you, certainly living in Hertfordshire, for climbing 10, 10 kilometres of, uh, you know, of, of mountain and descending 10 kilometres as well, while also trying to feed yourself and deal with temperature extremes. So the reality is that this, you know, where we are in and around London, you're just not equipped to, to train or prepare for that. And look, I, I, I make no pretense. Running's not top of the list. For me, it's enjoyment and what I do in my free time, truly. Even my yeah. training just has to fit around other stuff. Work and family uh, are up there, top spot. And, and, and anything I do in regards to training it just gets crammed in when there's an opportunity. So I'm not somebody who can jump on a plane and, and go and train in the mountains you know every uh, every every opportunity well actually I, I would do if i could get away with it but i, <laughs> I, I can't I, I can't um and so when we first turned up in chamonix it was just what on earth is this you know and, and you for, for anyone who hasn't experienced utmb it truly is magnificent it's it's and and you know you've touched on it it's not a straightforward process to end up in Chamonix. You have to, you know, tick a few boxes. But it's, to be honest, it's a little easier now than it used to be because you used to have to do three qualified three qualified events at least to get enough points. But now it's based on stones, so um, your stones just equate to the weight that your entry has in the ballot. So you could just yeah. do one. You could just do one of one event, a qualifying event, and have an index, and and you'd be eligible to enter. Uh, 
but yes, we, we, we went through the pain of, of qualifying and requalifying back in the day when it was very difficult. And you're looking at, for me, you're looking at fitting them, them in over a two year period. You don't just accumulate and acquire those points over six weeks, right? It's, it's a big deal, big undertaking, but we just weren't, weren't really prepared for what it would take. And um, quite frankly, hit, hit halfway, probably an hour before the cutoff and just hadn't eaten enough you know and then the time starts to run and then you're out again in the in the in the heat and you just lose time and and it's it's very very tough but it, it is achievable the thing about Chamonix is it, it's just so addictive because of the atmosphere it's so wonderful um you're in such a beautiful part of the world and everyone's just so friendly I mean, it's, it's not hostile at all the, the buzz, the atmosphere, it's, it's, it's just electric. But the very, the very start on the Friday night, you leave Chamonix at 6.30 and you head along um, almost on the flat. It's probably the flattest part of the course to Les yeah. And then you climb. You climb on up, up and over to Saint-Gervais and that in itself is, that's at least three hours um, before you hit Saint-Gervais and you, you're tired. <laughs> and you think, wow, okay, I'm only at the start. I'm not even 10% of the way through this race. And uh, you look at the map, you look at the profile, you've been studying it for weeks. And what you think is this gentle ascent to Les Contamines is actually brutal. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's tough, right? And the pack you're moving in this train of runners. There's there's no slacking. You just pushed hard, and so you get to Les Contamin around you know eleven between eleven or twelve, um, twelve a.m. That is on the Friday night. And you just you're you're in shock. This is on your on your first time, right? You are yeah. in shock. Uh, but that's part of it. And of course, I've done that three times now. So I, I know, I mean, you go to love it and you actually, those cutoffs, they don't phase me, you know, you used to be so stressed when you're so close to the cutoffs, but now with experience, you know, you kind of smile about it. Well, like, I know I'm going to hit that cutoff within 30 minutes of it, 40 minutes, no big deal. No big deal. Just got to keep doing, keep going, drink, eat, go. Yeah. So when you, when you did it that first time you were perhaps a bit underprepared for exactly what it was you by the sound <laughs> of it uh, hit some of those slopes and, and reached a shit what the hell have I done thing moment when, when you had to drop out was it instantly I'm gonna do this again or was there a moment of ah oh, sod it you know I had to go but I think I think certainly for me the first time I was so frustrated because I you know the, you wake up the next day You've not got a single ache or a single pain. There's no, you know, you kind of, at least, I'd at least like to not be able to walk for a day, right? Yeah. But it, it wasn't the case. And and that is the killer. I just, you know, I just messed up. I just messed up. This is easily doable. I've got to come back. So there was never a doubt first and second time. The second time I went, um, I was so sure I was ready. And um, I made such a dumb mistake. Um I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it, really. But I'd gone through a phase of really, really um, wearing my trail shoes in a relaxed state. And the problem is, on the descents, your your feet just um, slide. And yeah. I ended up with the most horrendous blisters. And they didn't develop straight away, but the damage had been done within the first couple of hours. And... Um, I ended up, I, I made it to halfway, but I was so upset with myself, right? Again, it's the pressure that I put on myself. No one, no one cares. No one cares. And my family are like, don't worry. You did, you did your best. And I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made a stupid mistake. So um, realistically, I was always going back. I just, yeah. It, it just demands so much focus and prep. You do end up exhausted mentally from it. And um, again, I know it's all self-induced, but you care about it. You invest effort and it's something you're doing for your own satisfaction. Um, it does just leave you tired. So I definitely needed a break afterwards. And I think the first and second time 
I didn't have any points left and I missed the boat. And so it's back to square one, which is even more annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. You talk about the blisters and all that sort of thing and making a silly mistake. But I mean, you'll know this with the number of races you, 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 you've done successfully and, and with the yep. old DNF. But there is so much that can go wrong when you're taking on those those long races, isn't there? And sometimes you can think, oh, yeah, that was a mistake that I've now been able to realise what it was. But other times it's just down to freaks of nature or or something odd happening on the course and or a body part giving out or getting yeah, hungry. Or, it's, yeah. it's, very, it's very true because, I mean, we... We're quite meticulous. We kind of keep a spreadsheet of all the kit and what we what we collated for each event and what the conditions were like. But because we're doing this for fun and it's a bit sporadic, we find sometimes yeah. you're relearning something that you actually learned five, six years ago, and you think, "Oh my god, how did I forget that?" Right? It's yeah. so, so dumb. Um, but you know, chafing or this or that, and just silly stuff. But you, you're absolutely right. You know, again, sorry to bring it up again. Switzerland, uh, as I left, people saying, oh, you know, good luck, good luck. And I said, look, I don't need good luck. Genuinely, all I need is no bad luck. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I've got everything else covered. I absolutely know what I need to do. I just, not need, I just need to not get an uh, upset stomach or I just, you know, I just need to not fall or something like that, right? Um, but you're right. Over that distance, um, when you are depending on, literally depending on a your supplies in a 20 litre bag that's sitting 20 miles away, um, you just need to have no bad luck. Yeah. But again, it's part of the adventure, isn't it? It's part of the fun, and um, and that's why we do it. We, uh, I think, most of us do it because we just love that sense of adventure, and like, I've got to get from here to here. And I've got to do it under my own steam and I've got to navigate and I've got to feed myself. And can I survive the heat and can I get enough sun cream on to not get burned? Yeah. It's all part of it. Yeah, definitely. And, and you spoke about the Swiss Alps there and not wanting it. I mean, you did actually have with the pole snapping, you, you did have that bad luck. But fortunately, or or thanks to your, your planning, you you had taken that second set of poles because I, I imagine if you hadn't, then... then well, I didn't I didn't end up using them, actually, Craig. Um, at the time, so I, I ran Switzerland with a friend of mine called Colin, Colin Anderson, and um, he, he said to me afterwards, oh, I was quite impressed with how matter-of-fact or, 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 you know, dead, dead certain you were. Because I said to him at the time, oh, dude, can you just stick with this pole? I've broken it. And he wanted to help me. He's like, oh, okay, should we, should we fix it? Should we tape it up? I was like, there's no point. Just stick it in. Let's go. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't even think about it. It was for me, look, it's no point. It's broken. There's no point dwelling on it. Just crack on. Now, of course, if it had been my watch that I'd fallen over and smashed, that would have been a problem because I think my watch was probably the most prized prized tool or a possession I had on that entire event. Um and uh, it's good to be able to follow you know, how, how many more kilometres you've got to go to the next checkpoint, et cetera. You know, I mean, I'm sure I'm telling you stuff, you know, but, um, but you know, if it's your trainers that fail, you know, you, you're ruined. But yeah. ult ultimately, I just thought at the time, look, there's, there's nothing I can do. I've, it's broken. And sure, of course, I wouldn't tackle an event like that with one pole ordinarily, but I had no choice. And I opted to not pull the other pair of poles out from my from my bag. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. I just so yeah, it's kind of pointless packing them. Uh... <laughs> well, I guess they were there if it had have got um, really really gnarly and and you'd have been struggling at that uh, at, yes. at that stage. It's nice to know that you've got those uh, that those things to back you up sometimes, isn't it? Um, sure. sure. So where uh, where where are you now on the on the UTMB journey? Are you uh, are you are you are you having to do more qualifying races? Are you books back in to give it another tilt? Well, luckily I have stones, and I have an up to date index thanks to last weekend. So um, I will put my name into the ballot, and hopefully, fingers crossed. I mean, I haven't been lucky enough to ever get a ballot place, <laughs> so um, I'm not sure anything will change this time round. But I will, I, I do, that's where my attention is. That's really where my heart is. I, I want to go back next year. 
Um, again, I've got some friends who are due to Russell and Ilza, his wife, is, are due to go back next year for probably a, a CCC attempt. And, um, you know, that's that's really wh where we are right now. I've got, I've got a couple more events in the calendar between now and uh, the end of the year. Um, there's Centurion Centurion 50 Slam events, which are which are going to be quite enjoyable. I've I've never done either of the two courses that we've got coming up. I think one is Chilton Wonderland, which is next month, and then um, November. I I forget the the course that we're doing in November, but uh, look, they 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 they're good fun. I don't mean to sound complacent, but we do those. We just enjoy doing those events. Again, it's just a great um a great group of people it's we have we have a good laugh it's it's a really nice day out out in the countryside and of course they're difficult they're challenging events um but a 50 a 50 mile event is very much more manageable than um trying to plan for something that spans two days yeah and you know the as you've sort of adhered to the the putting a huge mountain in the middle of it doesn't really help either does it? exactly exactly so so really i just want to keep those kind of distances going um I'll hopefully run with go beyond again in january at the country to capital event which is yeah. quite a, a regular one for us um and yeah and and then we'll see we'll have to try and get have to try and get something scheduled for early early next year so i've I've got something to keep me focused and um, and something to aim for. Mm. But other than that, you know, nothing, nothing else big. No, no other big races. Um, yeah. A few of us are going to be at the Arc UTMB Arc of Attrition, a fifty miler at the end of January, which is going to be something to look forward to. We've, I have been fortunate enough to finish the hundred mile distance at, at the Arc of Attrition, which is not something I ever thought I would enter willingly because i'm not really a big fan of the cold but um again uh a friend of mine russell he he talked me into that and and we ended up doing quite well it was quite a good experience but that's another beautiful beautiful part of the world uh, yeah but it'll be interesting to see with um the new management of of the arc of attrition it's now part of the utmb series or utmb family so be interesting to see how that changes the event. Um, no, it's yeah, I mean, you're, you're obviously a huge fan of UTMB itself, but but what do you make about the wider influence of UTMB as a commercial organisation? Because it's it's quite a controversial subject, really, mm -hmm. in some circles, isn't it? I, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily a huge fan. It's just that they are responsible and, and they manage that that pinnacle event in Chamonix. Um, yeah. And this, they certainly they certainly have a, a recipe that seems to be quite popular. Um, and, and now they're picking up and 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 rolling out their, I guess, their pattern and, and their management across the globe, their partnership with other races. Look, it works. It's work, it seems to be working well. I know it's a topic that has generated quite a lot of noise online and certainly some of the Facebook groups, people are so unhappy about it, but you know, I, I've got other things to worry about. I, just, <laughs> I, I didn't really get too drawn into it. And I know people felt very strongly about it, but it, it didn't really bother me too much. Um, uh, for me, it, it all boils down to can it, it is an event is it attainable? Can I enter it? What do I need to do to enter it? And is it going to be worthwhile? Do you get good value for money? Um, yeah. In in this country, you know that there are some race organisers that charge a lot of money for doing an event, and then you've got other very much more modestly priced, cheap and cheerful events that sometimes work out so much better. Um, yeah. Uh, again, I have no particular desire to um chase the name or the brand it's more about the the event and and actually for me it's it's all about chamonix mont blanc and and crossing that finish line and, and being part of um crossing that finish line i guess as part of that community which i suppose has has sort of given you such in, in enjoyment along the way mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that, that's true. I mean, so over the years, kind of my reason for why I run has changed and you start off chasing that. Oh, can I do that? Can I? That's something that looks really cool. That's very difficult. I want to do that. That's a bit harder. Wow, I'm suddenly running 100 miles. And then maybe your focus changes a bit and work takes back over and, and you end up slotting the running in rather than making it a priority. So you go for a little while where it, it's your your fallback, if you like. You, you're using it to recover from work. And th that's definitely a time when you're not going to achieve your, your best results and, and get all those finishes. But then it doesn't matter, right? It's You've got to remember why you're doing it. And as long as you align your objectives with with uh, what you're actually doing, then it's not a big deal, right? It's not a problem. But I have to, I will definitely make sure I, I step up and, and, and get my training back, back in order, and I refocus as we go into next year, yeah. Yeah, um, and um, and this this is a question that might sort of change the, <laughs> the tone of the, the conversation. It kind of depends on what you answer uh, answer it as initially, but when you're, when you're out training, when you're um, probably training more than doing the actual events, um, mm -hmm. uh, do, do, you, do you listen to music? Are you, um, are you a person who has, uh, has music in your ears while you're out there? Um, I actually don't often listen to music. I like to just enjoy yeah. listening and, and um, I might listen to the odd podcast occasionally, but, but it's very, very rare. And I take, um, I did take headphones with me in the mountains last weekend, but they are for emergency. I mean, they really are, or if, if, if things got so bad, <laughs> I needed, I needed some total distraction. But other than that, no, I tend to, I tend to not, I really do just love listening to the sound of nothing. And, uh, yeah. I mean, oh, I, don't know. I, 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 I love that. I love that. Well, no, I, I, I'll explain the the sort of reason for that that question, and there might be a supplementary where I can drag something out that that will work for what I was asking. I mean, I, I love the idea of listening to nothing. I'm terrible at it, though. I get caught up in my own thoughts, so I have to listen to a podcast or music because I don't want to listen to myself for too long. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the main reason I ask is because we've um, we have a show on 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 the network called um, "What's in Your Earbuds," which some people might have uh, listened okay. to, and it's all about the sort of music that people do listen to when the, when mm -hmm. they're when they're out running to to um, to encourage them along through runs and so on. So, so I guess my little extra attempt to draw out something out of you might be in those sort of dark moments where you do need a bit of um, uh, a bit of music. What do you um, what do you turn to? Because we've got a, we've got a, a podcast playlist on Spotify, and we like to we like to add these uh, add these songs to that playlist if we can. Yeah, I've got um, I've got such an enormous dance and house music collection. I mean, it varies right from early nineties right through early two thousands. I mean, just some absolute classics, and so that will often be a go to. If I do put the headphones on, um, yeah, uh, stuff that doesn't require me to have to think or work too hard at listening to with a, a good, strong beat. Certainly if I'm cycling or sprinting, that I would definitely put, I would definitely put music on, yeah. But if I'm out on the trail, it's very, it's very rare. But um, yeah, dance music is almost a, a dead cert. That's a bit generic answer for you. It's probably not what you wanted, is it? <laughs> no, you wanted to right. hear, you wanted to hear Shaken Stevens or uh, the Bangles, did you, or something like oh, that? Oh, everyone likes a bit of Shaken Stevens. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, anything. It's quite a, um, it's quite an eclectic, uh, eclectic um, list. There's some, some really um, uh, weird and wonderful um, <laughs> stuff on there, actually. But it does have a few, a few more, more dancey bits in there <laughs> too along the way. When you're doing that, just a thought that pops into my head. I mean, you sort of <laughs> say that you might do. Obviously, I get it when you're sprinting and training for that. But if if you're in a hard period and you put that on, is that just to keep you going forward, or that will you go right? I'm just going to run for a bit now that I've got this music on. Um, I think it's more of a distraction. And if you put on something familiar, yeah. Um, I having said what I just said, Craig, I did on MDS listen to music on some of the toughest parts and yeah. when i say toughest parts i actually ran out of water a number of times in the sahara um water back then it genuinely was rationed you were given your allocation and that was that 
Yeah. And I know that's not quite the case now. You could pretty much have as much as you need. So I understand. Um, but if you ran out of water before you got to the next checkpoint, that was it. And you're talking about running in up to, for us, up to 50 degrees heat. It's quite brutal carrying a pack with everything you need for that week, including all of your food and your sleeping gear in sand that just is giving away beneath your feet and sliding around. I mean, it's it's soul destroying, but equally wonderful. OK, um, but in 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 some of the dark moments on on that journey, I definitely listened to music. And if I listen to that same playlist, I've still got the same playlist today. I can still picture moments of climbing some of the sandy dunes and and it just for me it's ma that's magic right I, I just love that and and that's quite often where it takes me if i if i put my headphones on i'll be able to glimpse where i was when i heard that during tough times right yeah are you able to say what was what what's been harder like M mds or 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 utmb or is that an impossible um, question <laughs> Well, I think it's very difficult to compare them because the yeah. temperature, the temperature in the Sahara is 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 really tough. Having said that, apart from the long day, I don't want to sound. That sound makes me sound art, like an ass. But you're only really <laughs> running a marathon, a marathon at most a day, okay? Yeah, yeah. And most of it is flat. It really is. Most of it is flat, um, apart from the odd hilly June. Um, I, I have genuinely never done anything as tough as Arc of Attrition, which I finished, and that's because of the cold and the wind and the ups and downs and the terrain, yeah. and and equally running a hundred miles in the Alps. There's there's nothing that has come close to those two things, and uh, you know I'm very lucky, um, uh, very lucky to have been able to do both and. I, I keep looking. I keep looking for the thing that will just test me a little more. But, you know, setbacks come along the way and you get knocked back and you figure out, well, how do I address that? And um, now it's not the thing that breaks me that I'm interested in. It's just how can I be better and finish this? That's what I'm looking for now. How can yeah. I be better? How can I be stronger? And, and just just very quickly, finally, what would the time that struggled so much at the London Marathon or didn't enjoy the London Marathon so much and thought, oh, I'm probably not going to keep going this on this running lap. What, what would he think of what you've become and having done all these ultras and taking on these incredible well, events? I, I, I think I'd be surprised. I think I've been shocked, right? <laughs> um, again, I, I didn't enjoy that four hours hard and fast on the tarmac um, but you often lose sight of what you've done and, and what you've achieved and you get so swept up in stuff, life, work, that you forget about, you know, hang on a minute, look what you've just done and look what you've been doing. And it doesn't hurt every now and then to keep your head up. And, and again, I'm, I'm lucky people around me say, look, wake up, dude, come on. Don't give yourself such a hard time. Look what you've look what you've just done. But my nature, you know, and a lot of my friends' nature, we push ourselves hard. We we oh, that phrase I hate it. Work hard, play hard. But we do. And and um, it, running and and what we do in our free time is often a reflection of how hard we're pushing ourselves at work or or, or in other aspects of our life. So. Um, again goes back to the question you asked for why don't i just run a half marathon for me that's not the focus for me is just going how far can i go how far and, and how tough can i can i survive it and that's what that's what interests me oh so think, that's sorry go on quickly oh i was just gonna say my my younger self would probably say dude you need help <laughs> But well, and that's a that's a brilliant place to finish it. And I'm sure many people um, watching and listening to this will think, yeah, I, I know what he means. I've I've been there. I need some help as well. So thank you so much for uh, for sharing so much of your fascinating thank you for having me. story. I yeah, know you are more than welcome. And um, and thank you everybody for listening today to to Running Tales on the uh, Everyday Athlete Podcast Network. If you um if you enjoyed this show, please listen to our our back catalog catalogue 
easy for me to say um and uh and give us a rating or review a positive rating or review wherever you're having a listen um and and of course check out all of the other shows on the everyday athlete podcast network there are lots of brilliant shows on there and i mean i can highly recommend them all um so yeah thank you again so much for joining us thank you for to tan for joining us and uh i'm craig lewis and i'll catch you again in two weeks time for another 